Well, hello, and welcome to How to Diorama with Scale Monocraft. Uh, I am Bill, and uh, today we're just going to talk about diorama stuff, right? Um, oh, and I got some folks here. Um, Scott says, howdy, everyone from Texas. I hope everyone is going great, or everything is going great. Thanks very much, Scott. That's really cool. And uh, earlier, uh, GoPro Painting was here. Hey, John is here. Uh, John Robeck. Hello, John. Really nice to see you. Um, hey, now, this little group of folks that we got here, there's a nice little community, and there's a lot of uh, back and forth, and, and we talk about dioramas during the week, and, you know, there's, I get a lot of comments from Scott and Earl and John and, and go for it painting and, and, and folks, so if you like to be part of that, think about subscribing. Uh, I also have, uh, you know, a Facebook account and stuff like that, so check that stuff out, and um, it's a lot of fun. Because we just talk about, you know, dioramas. Um, so today is going to be kind of fun. Um, I did a lot more detail this week. And, and I'm going to show it all. But I also want to talk about figuring that out. Basically, how do you know when enough is enough? I mean, sure, you've got an idea. But there's still got to be some things that can help you make that decision when you say, you know what? I've got enough in my diorama and I'm ready to move on. It's, it's satisfied my original vision. Well, how do you really determine that? And how do you be sometimes um, objective? You know, you, you kind of, you, you kind of back off. Well, hopefully I got a couple of things that can, can help you do that. So, uh, and I want to say hi to everybody. Uh, Scott, be sure like, and subscribe. Thanks very much, Scott. That's really, really cool. And I appreciate that. I always forget. Hey, Martin's here. Hello, Martin. Uh, very nice to see you. Hey, and great stuff this week. I, I saw him post and, and then there was somebody that hopefully we helped out with a question. And that question was, you know, how to mount something in uh, pink foam. And um, it's very key that you do a couple of things. You don't have to do it my way, but if you can make these considerations, it's a lot better. Um, sorry, Oscar is like going bananas. It's a nice day out and he wants out and I can't let him out during the live stream. Uh, but don't feel bad. I think he enjoys it. So anyway, let's take a look at what I got uh, on st in store for you today. Uh, so this is um, just kind of what I worked on this week. Um, oh, and Martin said he was happy with your comment. That's really cool. So as a gentleman... Uh, what Martin is saying and, and, and what we're talking, I don't want to have like some double talk. What we were talking about was the gentleman was looking at mounting uh, like an acrylic rod in some pink foam. And I've done this and, and I did it on this current diorama, uh, you know, and I showed that technique. And, and the thing that's really uh, key here is you need some really strong hold, number one. And number two, you're dealing with an element that will melt under like any kind of a solvent, right? That pink foam. So you have to seal it. So what I do is I drilled into the pink foam and you can do it by using like a hot poker. I've done that and it works pretty good because it kind of carterizes, you know, it kind of seals the surface. I would still use something else because it's still that plastic foam after doing that. So anyway, make your hole. Then you want to coat it with PVA glue. And what the PVA does is that seals the solvent that you may put on it from the foam that will melt because of the solvent, because the solvent will just literally melt that stuff. And the CA glue has a carrier that will melt that. So you don't want that to happen. So you get the PVA glue in the hole. You have to let it cure. It's in a hole, remember. It takes a longer time to cure. There's not a lot of air circulating in this little tiny hole, quarter inch hole, whatever size it is. So you got to let it sit until it's dry. Once you confirm the PVA glue is dry in there, then you can use CA on it. Um, you probably also want to put it on the surface of the, of the foam that you're using too, just to make sure, you know, you don't have any spillover or something like that. And, and then you're fine to glue something in it and it'll hold. If you're now, I've done this and and it failed because the thing that I was trying to mount in there, I was using it as a mounting device for a model. Um, I built the Yamato uh, Bandai's the, the, the huge one, the big Yamato, um, and beautiful, beautiful kit. If if anybody's interested in that kind of thing, and 
I wanted to mount it on an acrylic rod in a base that I did. And I'd show you a picture, but I'm just kind of going off the cuff here. Um, and it didn't work. And the reason was there wasn't enough stability in the foam around it. So in that case, uh, what I came up with is I took the foam, I dug the bottom of the foam out so I didn't disturb the surface. The surface of the foam had already been context, uh, had already been textured and 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 really had a it had a moonscape on it. And I'll, I'll get a picture of it up eventually. Um, but that moonscape I didn't want to destroy. So I, I carved out underneath it and then I filled it in with, and I know it's right down here, this stuff. So I use Durham's water putty. Now this stuff is um, pretty heavy duty. It has its uses. And this is a really good one for it. If you're trying to make something that's going to be mounted in, and it needs to stand in foam, again, there's the instance where I used it. By carving out that bottom, basically I made a wider base with the acrylic rod going through it. The foam was only local, basically a facade. But that gave that enough stability to hold that acrylic rod to hold the model properly. Because it was a pretty big model. And I had it on a quarter inch acrylic rod. Balanced, okay, but still, it, it, it needed some more support. Well, this stuff works great. It is water uh, putty because you mix water with it. And it dries fast and it dries hard as a rock. And that's why it's called, you know, rock hard. So if you don't have that, I'm, I'm sure in your area, something like that is available. Um, from what I know and, and folks I've spoken to, it's available in the U.S. pretty pretty relatively easily, I guess, is the word. I don't know. Um, and yeah, it's great stuff. I would not try to use it for me personally for something I want to carve. It says it's carvable, and it is, but it's so hard it's tough to carve. So yeah, there's other stuff that's easier for me to carve. So I'm going to use that, but this stuff is great for that application. So um, thanks very much, Martin. I, I, I hope other folks, uh, you know, enjoyed and, 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 you know, got something out of that. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's good to know of these different tools and these different things that you can do. Um, and I'll try to pass as much along as I can. Just a second. So going back over here, what I'm talking about in details is this week, I kind of, uh, you know, here's the, the diorama. I'll call, I'll go back to that later. But I, I started with this. This is Captain Livin's lab. And Captain Livin's lab, Livin's lab is meant to be, um, you know, where he's trying to figure out how much or the type of fuels to use in the flame projector that he's building. And I had a few things in there and it looked pretty good, um, but it was a little barren. You know, I had a couple of things in there and, and, and as I started gluing these down, cause this is how it was glued down. That, what you're looking at right in the middle there, that little distillation, whatever the heck it is, uh, scratch built, so I don't know what it is, but it's supposed to look like a little tank that, for distillation of fuels and stuff like that, chemicals, blah, blah, blah. I just thought it looked, you know, if he's really going at it, there's going to be more. So I, I started in and I built these. Now, a lot of people have asked me, how do you build this stuff? Where do you get it? Well, where I get this is like a scrap box. And I did a short earlier this week, I believe, and talked about my little scrap box. And it's just a whole bunch of old um, kits, <clears throat> pardon me, and also um, kind of... Uh, uh, cast stuff, you know, people that do the resin castings and stuff like that. So at our clubs, and this is one of the kind of cool things at our club, sometimes people have some kits they want to give away. And if there's stuff left, you know, everybody's kind of gone through it and gotten what they want. And I get the scraps because I don't really care so much about the model because some of those, not all of them, some of them I want to use for parts. And so I will scrap them. And by scrapping them, I get these parts. And that's what these are. These are parts that have been scrapped. There's also parts that I just created. And by building this stuff up, I'm able to, and I'm going to go a little bit further. These are just some of the other ones. These are from kits. But then I can paint it up and 
you know, pretty simple, but very effective for what I want in the diorama. So you don't always have to go 3D printing, I guess, is one of the things that I've been trying to get across. Uh, I've, I've been asked multiple times, do you do 3D printing? And sure, I, 3D printing is great. I just don't tend to use it a lot. I really like hand building this stuff. And it doesn't take a lot. If you have the idea in your mind, um, you can build it, you know, and just just try, obviously. So I, I went in and, and I did this. And the reason, again, was I didn't think I had enough detail. I didn't think there was enough in there. So I built that. Then once I got that in there, I, I thought that looked good. But then I, I added this too. And, and what these are is these uh, these little three deals on top, they're cylinders from an engine. They're, they're like additions, um, like add-ons you'd buy for a kit you're going to build. And these would be the uh, engine parts. Well, they're still basically on the sprue. They're on the casting sprue that they came with. Well, I just painted them up and, and, and threw them up there, put a couple more things on it. And, and I think it looks like an interesting eye-catching something or other that looks in, in place, right? Um, I, I think that's one of the things that is really important about adding those details is it, it's got to look in place. If it's if it's completely out of the kind of scope of the other stuff that's in that area, it's not going to fit. It's not going to look quite right, unless that's your aim. Um, it should fit. I talk a lot about, or in the past, I've talked a lot about bringing in an element that people don't expect. Well, I also mentioned that it should fit. Now, I don't know what just happened there, but oh man, my... See, this happened last week too. My camera is going wonky. It is um, it is like cutting out on me because I think it's overheating. And, and I haven't figured out why that is. But um, there, it's back. So I'm sorry about that. If I'm talking on camera, I, I may just have to switch away to my, my pictures every once in a while. But making sure that it fits is super important. Um, so that's what I've tried to do with all these. After that, I said, you know, I kind of need something else. Now, to make this, I, I tried to take a fair amount of pictures of it, and I did take some video of it, and, and, and I'll show that in a video that I got coming out later. But this is just copper piping. All I've done here is used a copper pipe, um, and I put some sprue on the other side of it. That big lead thing, well, that big gray thing is just lead, uh, a lead weight wrapped in duct tape because I don't want to touch the lead. And so by doing that, and then by adding a little bit of sprue, adding a little bit of, um, of the bolts, the Meng bolt heads that you can buy uh, on the sheet, then I'm able to build this up and, you know, get me another tank. And so I, this, if you were to model this, and I guess that's a fair point to, to put in for the, you know, the 3D modeling side of it. If you were to model that or to find something like that, I don't think it would take less time than building it. It didn't take a lot of time. Yeah, I've been doing this for a while and I know what I'm doing, but it doesn't take all that long to learn these skills. They're not skills that you don't have already as a modeler. You're just taking a raw piece and seeing what it can become. I think one of the things that I kind of took from, from my background in, in manufacturing is, is I saw a lot of equipment and I saw a lot of individual parts that went together to build a component and from that component to build a bigger machine. And, and so that's my background. So for me, it's easy to see how to build something and then and then put it in place like this because I love how it fits. You can't see that much of it, but you can see uh, enough to get the effect that I was looking for. You know, now when you look at this with the proper lighting in this one, I didn't have a light. If you look over it, there's no light there. Um, I, I have just outside light looking in, but what I did was I added another light and then that, you know, kind of brought that particular piece out, the new tank. And it really, I think goes to show the room really well. So. That almost, and I've got some pictures later of that, that almost kind of completed that room for me. I thought it was great. Um, it, it, it kind of filled everything out. It, it took everything against that back wall and the side wall and just filled it in with equipment. And again, in this room, what he's trying to do is figure out chemicals. So it's all supposed to look like chemical stuff. 
you know, so it's like holding tanks and pipes and things like that. So, uh, and we got some other folks coming on. Um, uh, but, uh, but, uh, um, oh, and then Martin says when he was talking about the other gentleman, uh, he says, I'll refer to your channel, obviously. Sorry for, that I didn't get back to that uh, earlier, Martin, but with the camera. I don't know what's going on with my camera. It's it's getting wonky with me. Um, and then Mark is here. Hello, finally made it. Wonderful, Mark. Thanks very much for coming on. Uh, Mark is another gentleman that um, is one of my patrons. And so one of the fun things is, is I get ideas. And, and Mark has contributed a lot with like other people have in the comments to this diorama, as well as other dioramas. So that's the other thing is I feel like I get a lot from the community here. I get a lot of folks giving me ideas, some ideas I've had before. And it's like, oh, man, I forgot about that. That's a great idea. Some of them I never even thought of or I didn't think of it in this instance. Right. So I really appreciate those comments and and the, the things that you guys contribute. You know, earlier this week and one of the things we're going to talk about today is shrinkage of sandbags. My sandbags have shrunk uh on the on the surface um and so i'm going to show you that and and, and kind of give you my ideas as, as to what i'm going to do because literally they've all shrunk and i did not expect that um well we'll talk about that when we talk about it so let's go back to the pictures how's that so um in here i think it looks really good now it's tight then i moved to, and that's what I was trying to do before because I, I went ahead too far. Uh, I moved to this. This is the desk of the commander for the um, Anzacs. Now, I had a gentleman uh, ask me who were Anzacs uh, last night at the meeting, and just because he hasn't read about it. And, um, you know, I didn't, I, I had heard Anzacs back in the 80s because of Mel Gibson, you know, uh, and, and, and Gallipoli was like such a big, big movie and stuff like that. But, you know, the Anzacs were a separate unit, you know, and they, they were attached. And, and, you know, in the military, that happens a fair amount. You know, you might have a unit of specialists, and because the mission that you're on shifts or changes or, or has different requirements from your base unit that has there, they'll bring in another unit as an attachment to support the activity that you need. Well, that's exactly what happened with the Anzacs and the tunneling. They didn't do all the tunneling in France. Certainly, but they were specialized and they created specialized units for the Anzacs that came from Australia and New Zealand, both, uh, you know, came together. So uh, the miners would come in and they were basically there for their skills. They went through training, they went through basic military training, and then they assigned them to units that had both Anzac miners, people that were also just like the officers maybe coming in. And I'm basing this off Beneath Hill 60 and some other reading that I've done. But they would come in, they would form these units, and those units would have, you know, other Anzacs, but they'd also have British and and, and other, you know, soldiers in, in the Commonwealth. So these kind of units had a lot of different things they came in. So back to my original subject of detail, when I'm trying to detail this stuff, I'm trying to think of in this area right here, which is really mostly Anzacs because here's a common area. That's where this desk goes. And in this common area, this is basically where the Anzacs are going to be living. So I need to, I've got some basic posters in here. I've got some things that, that you know, look like, you know, uniforms hanging on a coat rack and, 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 and here's some of their tools. But what this needs is something that's going to distinguish it in such a way that you think Anzacs or you think Australia or New Zealand. Uh, it could be names of tunnels. It could be the name, whatever, you know, how they would put up little placards and say, you know, uh, Brisbane, Perth, you know, uh, Sydney, that kind of thing, X number of miles away or kilometers, whatever the case may be. That's the kind of detail that is not in this yet. So when I'm trying to figure that out, this is one of the things that I want to do. And there goes my camera again. I got to figure that out. So inside here, we have now... Um, Pretty much everything that I'm going to put in there, I need to do figures. I need to do um, some just like stuff. You know, I uh, there's a little table in there. I don't know if I have a picture of the card table so much. 
but um, no, I don't. But there's a little card table in there, and that card table, I want to have some guys playing cards. A couple of the guys. I've got some guys that sit down, some Anzac drivers, actually for another kit, but they're in a position where they can be seated, and I'm going to try to figure out making these guys uh, drive. Or not drive. They were driving. Figure out how I can make them look like they're playing cards. Okay, so now I'm having to, my camera's wonky, so I don't have a picture of me. So I'm just going to show you pictures and, and, and show you what's going on. This is now the testing lab. So I did a bunch more work here. I put lights in here and I mounted all of the gear that I've made over the last week, two weeks, I think. And, and I mounted all of that stuff inside here. And I think it's really filling out nicely. And, and the filling out part, is part of that detail. You know, I don't want it to look like it's sparsely, like there's just like a little bit of stuff in there. And that's kind of how I felt I had before. I had like the big thing, the flamethrower, and I had these big elements, but there was no bric-a-brac. There was no, like I said earlier, flotsam, you know, just, just stuff that is used or, or not used, but just fills the corners of this place, you know, on the floor, up on the racks, in the corner, all that kind of stuff. I really thought it needed that. And so that's what, what I did this week. So one of the other things, and this is just one of the cool things that I like, is I'm trying to look at this from all the different angles that people are going to look. If you look here, there's like a, a, a board above their heads and you got to step down, which was very true in the type tunnels that we had back then in World War I. So one of the things that I want to do is there's going to be a sign over that doorway because to have a sense of direction underground, what they needed to do was they needed to name the tunnels. They needed to have specific things that they could call upon that said, hey, you know, this is uh, uh, the direction. Because you couldn't really tell north, south, east, or west. You had to say, well, it's two tunnels from Sydney. And the name of the tunnel was Sydney. Or the name of the room was this or that. So that was one of the things that, that, that I'm going to be adding. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch my camera here real quick um, so that I can talk to you guys again and it's just i don't know what's going on it's just something funky but I'll, I'll figure it out eventually so now i'm using the camera on my on my computer but you know getting those things uh uh in there to kind of say this is the anzacs area or this is the british area or this is captain livens you know laboratory like we saw that's really important to tell the kind of story that I want. I want these to be distinct things. There's a specific units of a, unit of as uh, Anzacs that are doing their work. There's Captain Livens doing his work. Um, there's the guys testing. And, and again, there's going to be troops up top. So I have to have, you know, troops up here performing their tasks as well. And so... All of that has to come together to tell the story and fit together, but also sh show some distinction. Those are the kind of details, I think, that are going to really take it over the top. When, when, when I'm there, that's what I'm going to be able to say, yeah, I've got enough detail. I'm nowhere near that yet. When, when I'm thinking about what I want in here, right, how, how I want to tell the story, I want it to be like you're looking at a photograph and you go, what is that? I want you to be able to figure it out, but you know those 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 photographs you see of wartime or World War One specifically in the trenches. It's very compelling. Um, th there's a lot of stuff that you have to look at for a second and figure it out. Well, it's so close to reality, uh, or that I want to get so close to reality that that's the kind of impression that you get. You want to continue looking at it. You want to continue to see what's happening in that trench. So that's the direction I'm going, and if until I get there, I'm, I'm not done. So now some of the things about trying to find, you know, where your detail is, um, I think that also helps determining when you're done with finding your detail. Give me a second. Um, and I wrote them down. How about that? So um, does it meet your vision? Uh, you know, if it meets your vision, then okay, I guess. But where does that vision start? I specifically like to build out of my mind. 
not like I'm out of my mind. Well, maybe, but I mean, I want to build the vision in my mind. And that I think makes it a little bit more difficult. If you're building from a picture, it's not more, it, it's not easier any in, in, in any stretch of the imagination. But I would say you might be able to determine when you're done easier when you've matched that photograph, right? I mean, that has a definite or defined bit of detail in it because you're trying to match something in you know, a historical event or, or or whatever the case may be. But if you're just building upon a vision, you're building upon an idea that you have, um, how do you how do you work that? You know, how do you handle that? Well, I think it's by just having that clear vision and then going to reference. And, and that's what I mean by when I say I'm going to bring in elements that are specific to the people that are working in it. That brings an element of detail. I'm going to do it for where it is. That brings an element of detail. And I just think about all those different factors together and I try to satisfy each one of them individually. Up until now, I've been working on the environment of the environment. I've been just trying to get everything in there. Then I went into the main crux of the story, right? The, the living's gun and stuff like that. Then I did supporting uh, detail around it, the backstop for the living's gun to fire against. Um, how would they plan it? Well, there's a chalkboard in there. You see, there's levels that you go into as you're doing your, your, um, your, your detail. And as each level is completed, you just kind of want to continue looking at what level haven't I fit, I haven't addressed yet, or or what level hasn't been attained yet because I haven't considered that part of it yet. I think if you look at it all at once, it's too big of a problem. The other thing I think time is super important about figuring out what kind of detail you want. Um, over time, I get more ideas as to. How much detail I'm going to be putting into this thing? Okay. Um, I can't think of everything every day, every time. So if it's been three days since I worked on something and I go back to it, I might have new ideas for that area. And, and that's a great time to then work on it and, and, and put that detail in. So I, I wanted to talk about detail because I, I am so ensconced in it right now that that's what I'm thinking. I'm just liking to think about the finitest details that I possibly can, you know, bringing rats in my friend, Eric sent me, uh, and he's on the call a lot of times. Uh, he, he sent me a link and he said, Hey, have you seen these? And it's like a whole pack of like 23 pack of rats, uh, all 35th scale that I can put in here and it needs it. That was a very big issue. I've got pumps. I've got for air to bring air down into the tunnels. I've got pumps to take water out of the tunnels. I've got a whole bunch to do, but if I think of all that at the very beginning, I, I, it's just too much and, and I can't do it all. So over time, giving myself the time to do that, that's extremely helpful. Okay, so now there's a couple of other things that I want to talk about today. Um, one being I, this week, tried this. Now it's not a new product, it's newer. But um, it's the brass photo etching, uh, photo etch burnishing solution from AK. Um, I got it, and I'm not endorsed by anybody, so you know, this is just me telling you what uh, my experience with it was. Um, because one of the things it says to prepare your surface, uh, because it's for brass specifically, is it says to use either acetone or vinegar, and um, number one, I didn't want to use acetone, I have acetone, and I use acetone. But I don't like to use acetone. It's really caustic and meh. so I I thought, well, what else could I do? And and I thought, well, and, and I'm gonna try to go to the upside camera here. I don't know heck and if it's gonna work, but let's just see. Uh ba -ba -da -ba -da. I'm gonna give it a shot. Nope. Forget that. That's not gonna work that way. So I'll do this. Sorry, I'll get you there, folks. Okay, so we're going to do the top down. There we go. And this is a, a piece of brass photo etch. And the, the cool thing is, is this happens so quickly that I, I figured I'd show you. And, and here's the result 
of what I use to clean the, the brass and then use the photo etch. Um, this is after using some vinegar. Um, it didn't do awesome. Uh, this was just doing it on this corner, just doing this without trying to clean this. And so I thought, you know, man, I, I just I need to I need to show this because this is what I was looking for over here. And I got there with an eraser. Um, so what I did was I, I just remembered, you know, I, I worked in um, software for many years and did a lot of electronic stuff. And um, and prior to that, I did some manufacturing at a, you know, we manufactured machinery and brass uh, contacts are usually what you have like in a cylinder or something like that. And sometimes cleaning them, you would use an eraser and it works great. Well, I thought, well, why don't we try that? So what I did was, and, and I'm going to go over here because this is your parts over here. It's just kind of on the side, but I'm just real carefully going in like this. And I'm not really pressing down too hard at all, but I'm just trying to take it off. Now, there was some tape going across there, so I don't know if I'm going to get that off. Let's see. Yeah, it looks like it's coming off. But I'm just real carefully. I don't want to pop any of these parts out. I don't want to damage any part. And I think it did damage a part there. Um, I don't want to damage anything, though I may have. And then just that. Okay. So it doesn't look too different. You can kind of <coughs> see... Sorry, uh, you can kind of see that, you know, you've affected the surface of this. But then we're going to take some of the etching uh, solution here and just brush it on. Now, uh, I want to flood this. <laughs> it talks about flooding it. So I need a bigger brush so that I can do just that. I thought that would work, and it ain't. That's not real proper good English. So, just like that. Now, it's already starting to react. You see some of those darker pieces, but... <clears throat> excuse me. When I get more on there, it really goes to town. And as long as you keep it on there, and as it says on the instructions, you can agitate it while it's working so that it's it's hitting all the surfaces that you want that's going to do it now see how quickly that reacts um i'm going to leave that sit on there because i want it to kind of even out it kind of looks even in the camera as i'm looking at it this, the edges are a little bit lighter so now after it sits for a little bit then I can just take a little bit. I can take like a, you know, paper towel is what I'm going to use. Take the paper towel and blot it off. You could let it dry, I guess. And then I'm going to buff it because some of this stuff does come off. This is from last time. This You see these little pieces, the little streaks there. I'm going to kind of buff it off. And look at that. That is just now, that almost has a, like a bluing color to it. But that works just really well. And like I said, uh, you know, here's the vinegar. It says to, you know, clean it off with vinegar. Here's vinegar. I, I did try that. And, you know, it just didn't work as well. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it right here. I'm going to do the same thing because vinegar does etch. Uh, vinegar is an acid. So it will etch the surface. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to clean the surface so that we can use the etching solution. So... I've got it on there. I, it's flooded. Um, I'm, I'm hoping it's clean. I'm going to kind of rub it off and let's see how it reacts after I do the vinegar. See if it's the same or faster, or less effective, whichever. So I just, I want to make sure I flood it um, because I think that's, Part of it. So now look, it's turning pretty good and pretty quick. Doesn't seem to be going as dark. I see a brown starting to form. But yeah, that's not bad. Uh, it looks black in the camera. It does not look black to me looking at it from like a, a an angle here. 
So um, uh, I would say, I mean, it looks good. I, this is not scientific. I don't have a timer on, but I'd say it's good. Uh, I'd say this is better. I, I actually like it better. Uh, seems to be a little faster to me. Uh, it's definitely e more even. And I think if I probably maybe cleaned it more, a little bit more effectively, then I'd have a better result. Let's see if we can see a little bit better picture there. This is very blue. This is actually dark. And this one that I even let sit longer is, is almost black. So, yeah, I, I think that's another way. If you don't want to use any chemicals, if you don't have any vinegar laying around, I think the eraser works just great. Uh, worked great for me. And this is just a, like a Stadler regular Mars plastic eraser. So I like that. I, I thought it worked real nice. And um, I didn't have to bring out any acetone or anything like that. So the next thing I'm going to do, so I'm just going to keep the camera down here, is I want to talk to you about this. Now, I use, um, uh, this is the top. This is the surface. And what I did previously was, and I'm trying to get this real tight right in here. So what I did previously was I put this, uh, these sandbags in here, and I used um, the, um, oh gosh, what is it? It's the Sculpey Air Dry. I had it written down, and so I had to use my notes. Um, Oscar. So in here in the Sculpey, what's happened was it shrunk. Now, the size is one thing. The size, I'm not too worried about. You know, the size of the World War I um, sandbags were uh, 14 by uh, 26 inches or 14 by 33 inches. And, and it, it varies from there. I mean, heck, if you tie it back a little bit further, you're going to get a little different size. But I tended to go on the smaller side of that just because of the way it looked. But look right there. Can you see that up through here? In the middle there, into the corner, you can see it's pulled away from the corner. And that pulling away from the corner is just for the fact that these things are just slowly shrinking. The other thing that I noticed, and I'm going to get a pointer here so you can kind of see, is if you see these white marks up here, right here and here above them, well, those white marks above them are where they had actually stuck initially to the boards. So they've shrunk down literally a 32nd here, maybe even a 16th of an inch. So I, I just wanted to show you the result of, of what has happened over time, because this is something that I did relatively early on. It was probably in the first week or the second week. So it's been nine weeks, let's say eight, nine weeks since I put these in. And they've shrunk significantly. Um, are they ruining the effect? No, not in the least. Not, not for what I'm going to do. And, and after thinking about it, I thought, you know what? It's actually going to help. And, and the reason is I'm going to be putting dirt in here. I'm going to be putting, you know, mud and dirt in the form of this material, which is the um, sanded grout that I use. And I'm going to have that in these cracks. So when I first, that's the other thing, when I first did these, these were all touching. And you see these gaps, these great gaps between them. Those gaps did not exist when I put them in. I butted these things up right next to each other. But now that's going to allow me to put the sanded grout in between there. And I'll do it wet. So I'll make like a putty. And then that putty I'll apply and then wash back. And so it's going to fill those in really nicely. And it's going to look really cool here. And I'm going to show you from the bottom. It's maybe even easier to see here where it has separated. You can see all the way through it there where it's separated. I'll just put a little tape underneath there and, and, you know, seal that off so I can put some stuff in there. But yeah, that is surprising. The original um, putty that I used was Milliput. So I, I used Milliput on my last World War I diorama and it did not shrink this uh and i've used it for a couple of years now i've not noticed the shrinkage because of the application but here it's clear to see and so i just wanted to warn you about that is it bad no for me i'm not going to change it i could rip them out and, and redo them with milli put i'm not gonna i think they look great it's just that they shrunk and so it's something i gotta think about it's definitely something that i gotta plan for you know at this point in time 
So that's one of the things that I think, you know, is, is important. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not freaking out over it. I'm just like, okay, I got to adjust. It's just, it's a little bit different. Now, if it had been something where size was like key or critical, yeah, then it would have been a different deal. And there is an expectation of a sandbag being a certain size, but I don't think I've exceeded that or or gone to the minimum of that at this point. And so, yeah, I'm going to keep them. I think they're great. And I'm going to use them in the future for this. If I do another, well, I'm sure I'll do another one. But what I'm talking about future is I have to put sandbags on the top. So all along this top ridge, and there's two ridges, uh, all along these ridges, I have to have sandbags. I have to have barbed wire. I have to have a lot other elements. That's what's coming up. And so I am going to use this because though it shrunk, you know, me remember building it and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I do believe it's predictable. I wouldn't try to assign a percentage that it's shrinking. I, I, I don't think I can be that scientific. I could be. I'm not gonna. Um, but again, by sight and by what it, the outcome is, I think it's going to be just fine. So I'm not too worried about it at all. Uh, but I want people to know, I don't want to, I don't want you to go in and say, Hey, I'm going to use what that guy said. And then you use it and, and you get a result that you're not expecting. So anyway, that is about where I am. What I'm going to be working on now is finishing up as I'm doing, you know, I said detail, 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 and I'm going to, uh, start working on the top. That top surface, <clears throat> it's going to need lighting. It's going to need the whole, you know, rigmarole. Everything that I've done below, I'm going to do above. There's going to be a fair amount of equipment, but there's going to be a lot of people. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of people down below. But <clears throat> to do the above, to do the surface in the trench, that's really going to be critically key because the people are, you know, the thing that you want to focus on. And here I wanted to focus on other things, you know, and there will be people in here. I'm thinking there's going to be Captain Livens. We've already talked about He's going to be up top here. But I think there's going to be two assistants down below, which I'm really excited about, and possibly one on the ladder. I don't know. But there's, uh, of course, we've got three Anzac uh, diggers over here. We're going to have a couple of guys in there and maybe three because I think – um you know, having the, the captain or the leader of the Anzacs at that desk in there, I think that's important. And so, you know, I put a lot of work in that. And so we want that there. Uh, and then there's going to be people down in the test lab. Um, so there's going to be a lot of people. And I kind of want to do all the people at once because uh, that, for me at least, when I go into figure painting, I kind of really have to concentrate on it. And, and I've noticed that when I go into it that way and I set time aside, I get a little bit better at it. You know, uh, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, I don't do figures every day. I do figures when I need figures in the diorama that I'm building. I'm mostly a builder. And so when I'm doing this stuff, that's like my element. When I get into painting, I love painting. Uh, and, I, and I do a lot of hand painting, um, but I'm not so good at figures. So we're going to see how my figures come out. If I spend an entire week or possibly even two weeks building figures, painting and detailing figures, I know they're going to come out good. Um, it's just going to be, you know, how good is, is really the question. Sorry, Oscar had to come up and say hi because he's just really can't wait to get outside today. So anyway, that is where I am at with the diorama. Um, I didn't get a whole lot of questions today. Um, I'm sorry, let me go back to here. And maybe I did and I just haven't been uh, paying attention. Um, and go for it. Painting says, hello. And then Martin says, so I was painting. I missed a few minutes. So what's the purpose of this treatment? I used this stuff once but found it fussy and unneeded. Um, I believe you're talking about the uh, burnishing solution, Martin. Um, yeah, it's just to get, if you don't necessarily want to paint them, some of those elements could look really cool etched, but it'll also help paint stick to it. Now, I haven't had a real problem with paint stick sticking to, to photo etch, especially if you, you know, 
you, you wash it and stuff like that. But sometimes utilizing the photo etch as a burnish, uh, the color, it looks like metal. It looks like, you know, kind of like steel instead of brass, which I think is great. And I like to do that. Now, the other thing is um, I've got a bunch of brass bar here in where I've used it. Really thin. It's almost like brass wire. But no, baby, you can't. Um, but I don't want them to look like brass. I want them to kind of look like old metal. That stuff's perfect. So yeah, you're just burnishing it. Um, and, and as long as you prepare the surface, like I showed you today, either the, the eraser or I think the, excuse me, I think the, um, the vinegar did just fine. Um, it's not as even as the eraser. Uh, and it's not as deep as the eraser. I think the eraser actually probably took like maybe a, a micro layer off of the off of the um, uh, brass and just made it, you know, much easier to adhere to. Um, that would be the purpose for it. I like it. So um, and um, one of the curious things about it, and I don't really have an example. I tried to create one. Oh, yeah, it did work. Um, so this is kind of funny. Um, I noticed because earlier this week I wanted to get some railroad ties in here. And so those railroad, not, not railroad ties, sorry, railroad track in here. So I made a, a little thing of railroad tracks stacked up in the common area. You're getting down. There we go. And so in doing that, I thought, you know, I'm going to use this, this etching so it doesn't just look like brass tracks. I wanted to kind of look, you know, uh, burnished. Well, I dunked them in the stuff and it did pretty good. I, I didn't clean the surfaces properly and things of that nature. But um, what it did do was it bleached my wood. Can you see that? It bleached it. So this is what was dipped in this solution. Now, if we look at the other side of this, this is what was dipped in my vinegar and um, uh, steel wool solution. So I think that's really cool. So what I found was I can now take this wood, right? And I can use the, the steel wool and vinegar solution and I can make it this color, which is like a grayish aged wood color. It's the same trick that um, railroaders have been using for years on building old mine equipment, stuff like that. You know, they build out a boss wood. Well, that's what they use is, is the, the, the steel wool and vinegar solution. What it does, it gives you this really nice grayish wood patina on either basswood or on balsa wood. Works great. But now I also have a solution that can reverse it. So that's pretty cool. That's the kind of thing that I love about model building or just, just getting familiar with a product or something like that is you find these little tricks because right now or before this, I had no idea how to do that. If I had gotten my wood that color, I didn't know how to bring it back to its original color. This stuff literally bleaches it out. So that's not an intended use for it, I would imagine, but it works and done deal. Now, I wouldn't mix vinegar with it. I don't know what these chemicals do, but this was completely dry before I treated it in the photo etch burnishing solution from AK. And this is the brass. I've not tried any other. This is for brass specifically, but I thought that was pretty cool that it bleaches it back out. So there you have that. And uh, maybe you didn't know it before. So that's kind of cool. Uh, Paul said, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, read what Mark said. Uh, laugh out loud, 24 pack of rats. Uh, and I can't wait to get them. I haven't ordered them yet, but uh, Eric sent me the site and I totally want to get those rats. Um, looks natural, life is never perfect. Yeah, and that's exactly right, Paul. It should never be perfect because nature is not. So I always go for like modeled or something colors, you know. Uh, Martin says, I was referring to the etching PE. Yep, yeah, no, no big deal. And the time lag is my fault because I'm yammering here. Uh, okay, I thought I needed to keep that black crap on it. No, yeah, it kind of comes off and you can paint over it. And because, and, and this is what uh, Martin's referring to, once I kind of burnished it off and cleaned it off, 
that's a great surface to go ahead and, and take paint because you don't have anything on the surface anymore. So yeah, you, you don't have to keep it black, but I like the black. I, I love changing the color of metals because I use brass a heck of a lot in these and I've never had something consistent that I could do that. Well, now I do. So that's great. So really happy about that. Uh, there we go. So if, if there's any other questions, I would love to answer your questions. Um, I don't know what's going on with my camera. It worked fine for a long time. Now I'm using the camera that's on my computer, which is great. It works fine, but it doesn't give me all the switching around capability uh, between stuff where it's, it's a lot easier. So now it's a little funky. So I got to figure that out. I will. Um, and uh, by the next time we do this, you know, heck, hopefully it's better. Um, if you like this kind of content, I mean, how could you not? You know, it's a train wreck every time. Um, if you like this kind of content, please subscribe. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and, and I love talking to folks, you know, during the week, uh, as I said earlier on, I typically get a lot of texts and, and things like that on my posts because I do post daily a short, um, and then I also do this weekly. Um, it's pretty fun. I do this all day long. Uh, in the mornings, it's computer work, so I try to get back to everybody on the computer in the mornings. But in the afternoons, I'm building, and and I'll build till midnight lots of times. Uh, I don't want to all the time, but I get so into it, and I'm just like, man, you know, I can't stop. So um, I always have a lot of content, and I always have a lot of uh, uh, fun things that I learn because uh, I really like to try stuff. So if you're interested in that, subscribe, and hope to see you in the future. So thanks, everybody. Uh, okay. I thought I needed to keep that, but oh, we already talked about on it. So thank you everybody for coming on today, uh, and, and putting up with my camera, my crazy camera issues. I don't know what's going on. It should have been fine and it wasn't. So I will figure that out for next time and, uh, we'll see ya. I hope you have a great day. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.